Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, and Dining Out for Life. Welcome to the March edition of Feast TV. This month, we are focused on what it means to be a chef working here in the city, and we're gonna get you into the kitchens of some of St. Louis's best restaurants. Now, throughout the episode, I'm gonna be demonstrating a recipe by Shannon Weber, who is the columnist that writes our Mystery Shopper column, and these are panna coken that are filled with a sweetened cream cheese and topped with a lemon and blueberry sauce. It's a great brunch dish and perfect for late winter, early spring spring dining. We're going to be pairing the panna coken with this bottle of White Lady, which is made by Hermann Hoff Vineyards in Hermann, Missouri. It's a German style light white wine that has a slight sweetness that's going to pair really well with that blueberry lemon sauce that we're going to put on top of the dish. Now, if you've ever wondered what it's like to be a chef de cuisine in one of St. Louis's top restaurants, you're in for a treat because we had a chance to spend a night on the line with Nate Hereford at Niche Restaurant in Clayton. Go ahead and take a look. My name is Nate Hereford. I'm the chef de cuisine at Niche Restaurant. So I think uh, like the role of a chef de cuisine, uh, their job is to run the kitchen. And in that sense, their job is also represent uh, the executive chef when he is not in the restaurant or when he's in the restaurant. You know, whether we come up with you know, new dishes, it's uh, my responsibility to help execute them to chef standards. And also at the same time, uh, it's my responsibility to run the kitchen uh, the way the chef would want the kitchen run. I got in a little around noon yesterday. Uh, which is pretty typical. Kind of check on our books, uh, make sure, you know, see what our cover count is, allergies, restrictions, things like that. Typically I'll think, you know, what do I, what do I have to do for the day? What do, what do we need to accomplish? Are we going to have enough meat? Are we going to have enough fish? Like, do I need to get this stuff rolling? Do I have backup plans in case there are any issues? And then constantly, it's kind of a constant ebb and flow of checking everyone on their stations, making sure people have the product they need for service, making sure they're doing well with their prep, making sure they don't have any issues with anything, um, tasting food as it comes along. They'll start putting up dishes and we'll taste every dish on the menu. I think your trotter could have more salt in it. I think everything else is banging. And then at 4.30, every day we'll do a lineup uh, at the bar, the front of the restaurant. We'll all go over food changes, uh, answer service questions about food, and then it kind of acts as like a pep talk for, for the night. Here's where it gets fun. We have six portions of lamb and we have lamb belly that we're confined right now. And if that's potentially done and awesome, we're gonna serve that. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. So this one's like two and a half, this one's like just a three. You know, we'll get the order in. Um, it will kind of print out, you know, how many people are on the table, what kind of menu it is. You know, we do a la carte here, but we also do primarily prefix menus, which would be a four course. We also do like an eight course tasting with a couple snacks also as well. Um, I kind of organize like a board, so it's kind of like a chess game where you can kind of see where everyone in their dining room is. How long in the first full order? We're walking in, two tastings, both mid-rare please, table six, two Kali pasta. I'm gonna pick all this stuff up and then go on the passes. And there's uh, one more taste of pork to the gentleman of pork. Food will start coming up, and then they'll fire, then we'll walk the food, we'll write the time, we walk the food, and then there will be a, uh, a course two buttons, they'll fire their second course, we'll pick it up. You know, we just try to work on our timing, and our pacing. Nobody, you know, no one likes to sit in a restaurant and wait for like 25 minutes between courses. We try our absolute best not to ever, ever let that happen. Yeah, 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 give me a pasta in the window and one esco right now, please. I got your esco. Thank you much. You know, last night, for example, we were like pretty much empty till seven o'clock and then we filled up. We did like 40 people at once. It went really good because everything was paced out. So it was like one ticket after another. It was constantly moving hard for a couple hours. 
constantly pushing it, try to push the food out. And so it's a really big adrenaline rush when you have a really pump at night and it's just everybody's working in tune. The gentleman down here is pay attention, just warming us up. BC boys style, low and slow. That is the tempo, copy. Let's pick up uh, two pork, please. And you know, you just kind of start like, like we refer to it as like, we start dancing. You know, you just start pushing the food out. People are psyched, kind of feed off that energy and it kind of becomes contagious. You know, that was one of the things like when I first got into cooking that really kind of, I really always loved and really I don't think I'll ever get over. The dedication that the Chefs to Cuisine show across the spectrum in St. Louis is very inspiring. Very first thing we're going to make in our Panna Kokan recipe is the cheese filling. And this is an extremely easy thing to do as most of the recipes that I demonstrate are because I want cooking to be easy for you guys at home. This is just cream cheese that's been brought to room temperature. And now we're going to zest two lemons now when you're zesting, as always, just get the top layer, don't get that bitter pith, and you're going to zest both of these guys. Now, just a cup of powdered sugar, two teaspoons of pure vanilla, maybe a little more if it falls into the bowl, and then about four tablespoons of heavy cream. Now this is the secret ingredient. The mystery shopper column that Shannon wrote is actually focused on malab. And don't worry if you've never heard of it. I really hadn't heard of it either before we did the research on this piece. And it's a, a Middle Eastern spice that is seeing a real resurgence in use in a lot of baked goods. And it really doesn't smell like anything until it's ground. So I'm gonna show you how to grind it um, in a spice grinder. This is a coffee grinder turned spice grinder. And you don't want to mix the two together because coffee has such a strong uh, flavor to it and aroma to it that it will, um, it'll just kind of mask what a lot of your spices actually smell and taste like. So I've put the whole malab in. So we're gonna put in a teaspoon and a quarter of this freshly ground Malab spice. This is a pretty difficult spice to find, but if you go to international markets, you should be able to track it down. Now, we're just gonna beat it until it's smooth. Now I'm gonna set this aside while I make the other components for my dish. And in the meantime, let's take a look at this next segment where we're going to take you into the kitchen at Elia and Olio and meet Josh Charles, another chef de cuisine here in St. Louis, who is working with Ben Paremba to make one of St. Louis's most interesting restaurants a total success. Attention to detail is everything. We want people to have great experiences and for me when I go to a restaurant and if I come back to that restaurant you know I want to discover new things and that's why we have all kinds of fun things to look at everything is very carefully choreographed the food in, in Olio uh, is sort of an accumulation of just my identity I grew up in Israel and I moved here um, my last year of high school. I've traveled a lot. My mom's from North Africa, my mom's from Morocco. So there's this, a lot of these reference uh, points that I have from my travels, from um, food I grew up with, uh, the street food in, in, in the Middle East and, and generally in the Mediterranean. But it's also a lot of American things. Those flavors, those colors uh, sort of inform the stuff we serve at Olio. Elia is sort of a similar story, but it's, uh, it's sort of my identity as a professional cook uh, and the things that informed me in my, in my profession, in my career. So first and foremost is my mother, who's a trained cook, a chef herself, and the food that she used to cook. But then my own development, living in Italy, uh, you know, try to be contemporary and, and take cues from different progressive and avant-garde methods of cooking. So naturally, this is a little more refined and a little more composed, uh, a little more uh, even experimental, if you will, and the other one is just plain fun. We have Josh, uh, who's very, very young, uh, but 
very dedicated, very skilled, very, uh, very creative. What attracted me to this restaurant so much was the flavor profile. So I already had the base of French cooking, uh, and then whenever I got here, Ben showed me the flavor profiles of Morocco and really showed me how to use these ingredients. Right away, I knew that that was the food that I wanted to be cooking. Uh, very meticulous and uh, artful but also uh, classic in a sense. And it's all about the details and making sure that everything's covered. If there wasn't the meticulousness, uh, I think I would get bored very quickly. So working with Ben is, it's challenging to say the least. Uh, he pushes me every day to be the best cook that I can be. In other restaurants, it was designing a menu and then buying the stuff. Here, uh, we've kind of flipped that around and we actually buy the stuff, uh, prep it, and then we make the menu based on what we have. So as always, the whole thing's gotta get a lot of flavor, yeah? A lot of aromatics. We wanna keep the dish very, very classic. And basically, the leg that we can feed, we're just gonna warm up in the sauce, and so it's coated in sauce. I don't want any browning on the sauce, it's gonna stay white and nice. Look how far this is reduced down, it's really beautiful and nice, that's what we want. I'm just thinking like a classic French dish, this might need some butter, Finish it off. So, the little mustard seed, the pickled mustard seeds. And we might not need these. I just think that they're going to be a nice little filler, and they're crunchy, and it, you know. Right. I'm thinking east of Perry sort of flavor. So mustard, and we have any mustard greens? Uh, not today. Mustard greens will be nice with that. Maybe it doesn't need to be mounted with butter at all. Butter. Just makes it cloudy. I don't like that. One here. So maybe a little flavor right there. A little bit of our chive oil. You like it on the black plate? I do actually. You can use a little extra starch. You want to do some tarragon tonight? Deal tarragon and, and chive, the usual suspects. That's yeah, it. that's it. Ben Paremba has sparked a total renaissance in Botanical Heights. Not only Elia and Olio, but also La Patisserie Chouquette, Old Standard, which is his new fried chicken joint across the street. And he's also going to be doing grab and go foods with the new Global Foods that's gonna be opening up in the loop. He's really bringing a ton to the St. Louis scene. And I'm excited to see um, what he does next. So what we're doing next is making the blueberry lemon sauce. And again, this is incredibly simple. Now we're using frozen blueberries and before you say oh my goodness frozen blueberries it's really important to note that especially when fruit is out of season using the frozen variety you're going to get more of a fresh flavor because these types of berries are flash frozen right after they're picked and so it's better to get something that is frozen than something that is out of season and has been sitting on a shelf for a long time so we're going to do uh, just about 24 ounces of these frozen blueberries. We're going to add in two thirds of a cup of just regular granulated sugar. We're gonna take the two lemons that we zested previously and we're just gonna go ahead and squeeze those into this mixture. And just to avoid getting any seeds in there, I'm just using this uh, wire sieve. It just makes things easier and you don't have to worry about seeds. So my blueberries are simmering on the stove and they need to simmer for about 20, 25 minutes until they're reduced and slightly thickened. And so now let's head over to Element near Lafayette Square and meet Brian Hardesty, who is running his Kitchen by Committee. I wanted to have a place that would feature many different points of view rather than just one person. I thought that it would be really cool to feature all of the stuff because everybody contributes and I have a bunch of talent here, so I wanted to, you know, showcase that. Basically, we have these slots to fill. It's the seasons changing and we know what's available locally or what's just really good nationally. And so somebody will get interested in an ingredient, start building a dish and as a team, we'll critique it, which is the whole point. You might come in and have 
a chicken dish one day, but the next day it's the same components, but it's a completely different perspective on that dish. And so hopefully it's elevated. So the first dish we're gonna be showing you today is our gnocchi. It's uh, inspired by cacio de pepe, which is a black pepper pasta uh, by chef uh, Chris de Mercurio. He's got a lot of experience around town. He's the, actually the first person I hired here in the kitchen. We sear the gnocchi and it's super simple. Our second dish is the lamb pot roast by Chef Sam Bettler. He comes out of St. Charles. He consistently has great dishes and you know has a backlog that I can't wait to put him on the menu for the next change. It's slow braised, 16 hours. Like a traditional pot roast, it's like you know super tender and comfort food. But uh, we wanted to keep it with the season. This dish hit our menu around Christmas time, so we decided to. Serve it with roasted fingerling potatoes and carrots, and then we did like a spiced wine sauce, so kind of that Christmas feel. Really, it's not approaching the situation like a jerk. Like everybody is constructive with their criticism. Like if I don't like something, you know, we have a relationship. Everybody does where we can be honest and we're not bruising anybody's egos to say, well, you know, maybe this doesn't quite work or maybe this doesn't make sense with the season. So everybody gets to have their 15 minutes, you know. So it's pretty cool. Our third dish is a uh, pork tenderloin by Chef Brian Coltrane. He comes from table and niche and he is super solid. Our fourth dish is by uh, our pastry chef, Megan Boyer. Beer and chocolate is the title. Coming up in the business, I would contribute to menus here and there, and uh, my peers would do the same thing, and they weren't celebrated, and usually the, the accolades went to the guy in charge, which is, you know, how it should be, I guess, but I kind of thought differently. I thought, okay, well, why not have all this talent in the kitchen that I can showcase in the open kitchen and give credit to, because they're all great guys, and any one of them can take my position, and that's how it should be. What Brian is doing over at Element is really unique. It, uh, I think it takes a lot of, um, of just general personal courage to be able to give all of the other people in his kitchen the same level of control and input that he has, and it's turning out to work perfectly for the restaurant. As you can see, the dishes are absolutely beautiful. Um, so now we're going to get into the Panacokan portion of our recipe. And so in this bowl, I have uh, flour and sugar and baking soda and salt. And so now what I'm going to do is just add in a couple of tablespoons of that malab. And you know, when I smell the malab a second time, what I really kind of smelled was uh, European pastries. In this large bowl, I have all of the dry ingredients. If you head over to feaststl.com, you'll find all of the measurements for this recipe. 
So now we are going to do all of our wet ingredients for these essentially pancakes. And it's just two cups of whole milk, two tablespoons of butter that has been melted and then cooled, just a quarter teaspoon of vanilla, just a couple of eggs. These happen to be from my Happy Backyard chickens. And then we're just going to mix everything together thoroughly. Blend it. So now we have something of a well in the dry ingredients and I'm just gonna pour the wet into the dry. You don't wanna overmix because if you do, you could make the batter tough. So just stir until everything is fully incorporated. So after I incorporated the wet and dry ingredients into the batter, um, I needed to let it rest for about 20, 25 minutes, and you'll see that the batter is very, very thin. Um, so the, the pancakes that we're making are gonna be more like crepes. And you just take about a quarter cup of the batter, spoon it into a non-stick skillet that just has a little bit of uh, non-stick spray on it. So you'll see it's gonna spread pretty rapidly. We're gonna let that go ahead and get golden on one side and flip it over. Pancakes are piling up here and as you can see, they're very thin and the idea is to cook them relatively quickly, making sure obviously that they don't get burned. So while I finish, all these little guys up. Let's head over to Blood and Sand, where Chef Nicholas is infusing the menu with new energy. And let's also meet the owner, TJ. So the first dish we're gonna be doing is our charred bluefin tuna with apple, bone marrow, shiso, a little bit of lemon, and togarashi. So first thing is to torch the tuna. So why torch it rather than just sear it really quickly? It's kind of a Japanese technique that really gives a, like, for lack of a better term, almost like a gasoline-y, in a very good way, kind of flavor to it. It's just, a, you know, a different, a definitely a lot different than grilling it or searing it. We'll start uh, building the plate. The first okay. thing is uh, apple bonito gelée, and just a few slices of green apple. Your plating is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, you make it, it's just so artful. I always think it should look like a, either like a little landscape or like something from Candyland that you want to shrink down and play on. And that's the tuna with bone marrow, apple, and shiso. I think the reason Nick's cooking style is melding with our members is really Nick listening to what he was walking into. And he's keeping the menu accessible while adding some components I don't think we definitely have never had here before. And it's accenting what he's learning from the restaurant as opposed to him imposing his will. I don't think he had an agenda when he started. He just wants to have a good time. Coming into Blood and Sand, uh, you know, as the new chef with already an existing menu and existing members with expectations, as I, I treated it with great sensitivity. After conversations with TJ and, and the, you know, the staff here, like what are some favorites? Like what should I leave alone like while I build trust with the, with the members here? You know, here we are now, uh, you know, a month and a half into me working here and I, and I love it. So the next dish we're going to be doing is going to be our parpadelli with blood orange, shrimp, tarragon, and gremolata breadcrumbs. So the whole thing starts with basically just reducing uh, blood orange. Shrimp and citrus obviously goes very well together. Uh, so it was just you know something kind of something that led us to do that you know want to do pasta with it and that you know obviously there's citrus in the gremolata breadcrumbs. So I think that's kind of what brings the the whole dish together. Once it gets to about that point right there, we can drop the pasta. Like the, the shrimp can come in. The shrimp have just been like lightly poached ahead of time. Okay. With a little bit of olive oil and tarragon. Fire shrimp heads. So pasta's ready. So do a little bit of the, the cooking liquid. And then to finish that, a little bit of gremolata breadcrumbs. Nice. There you go. A little uh, fresh tarragon. And then the shrimp heads. Okay, so the last dish we're going to be doing is going to be our uh, grilled Iberico Secreto with chestnut. Mandarin oranges and treviso. And it's basically the inside skirt steak of the, the Iberico pig. 
So it's extremely fatty, extremely flavorful. To do the dish, we basically just grill it on both sides. And the next thing we're gonna do is gonna be sear some treviso. A little bit of white balsamic. This is a chestnut puree. It's basically just chestnuts cooked down with a little bit of water and butter. Some of the really quickly wilted treviso with the white balsamic. A few slices of mandarin orange. And again, we, we, you know, we serve this a little bit pink, which is really the best way to eat oh. it. It's just super flavorful and delicious. That's beautiful. You know, my style really is taking the best ingredients that I can possibly get and treating them with as much respect as I possibly can. I think really just to kind of just keep experimenting and exploring with, with you know, new techniques and new things, kind of comforting things, but that push people a little bit out of their comfort zone, but with comforting, you know, foods and ideas. So when you build a really good team and you have great people around you, you have to keep them hungry. And a, a good way to do that is new ideas, new experiences, something else to work on, especially the kitchen. And these people behind the bar, they're hungry for stuff. I think what I love most about coming into the kitchen, and in, in, especially in this kitchen, is just is how rejuvenated it. And I feel like I have a new lease on life with just these with these guys in this kitchen, and you know, kind of the direction that we're taking the food, and just how focused they all are. It's you know my job to to match it, if not you know exceed that. The family aspect that we have here is just incredible, and I think that's what I love so much about coming in here every day. So Chef Nick over at Blood and Sand uses a lot of acid in his foods to really make all of those gorgeous flavors pop. He's incredibly talented and I'm glad he's here in St. Louis. And just as a side note, Blood and Sand still does have um, some memberships available. So here are our panna coken, and they're just stacked up. I'm taking the cream cheese mixture and spreading a nice layer on the inside of our pancake and I'm just going to roll this guy up and I'm going to make a series of those and put them on the plate and then we're going to drizzle it with some of this gorgeous blueberry lemon sauce. So I've rolled all of our panna coke in and I'm going to just drizzle this with a little bit of the lemon blueberry sauce just to give that beautiful tart flavor. Oh, this looks so gorgeous. Imagine presenting this platter at a brunch that you're hosting at your house. Everybody will just ooh and ah over it. A little bit of toasted slivered almonds, just for a little bit of crunch, because all of these elements are pretty soft. So if you wanna have a little bit of variation on um, in the texture on the plate, that'll add a nice, uh, nice pop. And then I'm pairing this with the White Lady from Herman Hoff, uh, which is in the Herman region of Missouri. This is a German style white blend that has a slight sweetness to it. It has a little bit of kind of a citrus acid nose to it, which plays amazingly well with the lemon that we have in the cheese stuffing as well as the blueberry sauce. Oh, I can't wait to dig in. Cheers, and I'll see you next month. <laughs>